You know, Dan, how does ethnicity impact vitamin D status? Obviously, you know, in working with Canada basketball, a large percentage of our players will often see, um, you know, levels that are persistently low. Um, you know, so how does how does ethnicity impact this whole story? This is this is a fascinating area of the whole vitamin D story. Um, the, the first thing to mention is that skin pigmentation is certainly a limiting factor for uh, dermal vitamin D synthesis. So we've known for a long time that dark-skinned athletes um, need longer in the sun to produce the same vitamin D as a lighter person, a lighter skin person would for a shorter amount of time. Um, and it's actually argued that light skin is, a, is, a, is an evolutionary adaptation to migration away from the equator. Yep. So that's, that's pretty interesting in itself. Um, ethnicity does also seem to have another effect on the vitamin D endocrine system through um, population-wide genetic variations. So there's been a number of studies now that have, have kind of sought to identify whether Differences in ethnic co cohorts uh, respond differently to di vitamin D supplementation because it seems that black and, and Hispanic men, for example, um, have a higher risk of osteoporosis and, and fractures, but they actually have lower um, a, a lower 25 OHD um, uh, than Caucasians. So one area that's kind of been explored to try and account for this is genetic variations um, in vitamin D transport system and vitamin D metabolism. So, I mean, just to give a, I guess, a little bit of background, vitamin D or 25 OHD, when it's circulating in the blood, um, about 85 to 95% of that is, is bound to the vitamin D binding protein. And only about 10 to 15% maximum circulates as uh, bioavailable um, or, or free. Um, and what's been suggested is, is actually that due to genetic variations in the vitamin D binding protein, we may actually see variations in the free fraction or the bioavailable fraction, meaning that despite the fact that uh, black individuals have lower 25 OHD, they may actually have higher amounts of the bioavailable fraction. So this has kind of brought about this idea, well, you know, are we, are, should we be measuring more than just you know tw um, total 25 OHD, do we need to be start to be looking at um, you know at other things as well? So there are certainly ethnic differences be um, um, between uh, populations of individuals that that do lead to differences in the vitamin D endocrine system. And again, it's something we don't know enough about yet. And for sure, it's going to have implications for the way that we supplement with vitamin D going forward in the future. And Dan, do you think we are measuring the right thing in terms of being able to measure both the 25 OHD and actually starting to measure the 125 as well in, in concert? Is that something clinicians should be considering to get that assessment of bioavailable D rather than just simply relying on serum D, which is most common practice? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, certainly we, what we're doing going forward is, is suggesting that, you know, in addition to measuring total 25 OHD, that, you know, clinicians could move towards also measuring the bioavailable fraction for sure. Um, there are assays available out there for this. So one of the limiting factors in the past was that there wasn't really a, a commercially available way to, to measure that bioavailable fraction. Um, that, that is available now. We, you know, we've seen uh, a number of individuals and groups, uh, some select few teams, uh, sports teams are starting to move towards this as well. Um, and it's something that we are spending a lot of our time now thinking about and a lot of our research efforts are, are going into measuring both of these metabolites because we do think that there may be subtle differences that, that might be able to explain um, physiological outcomes better than just measuring 25, total 25 OHD on its own. Yeah, that's that's uh, fascinating stuff. And you know, if we continue on this road talking professional sport, um, a lot of Professional teams and elite teams have gotten into a practice, you know, in the last few years of mega dosing vitamin D, you know, taking 50,000, 70,000 IU, you know, mm -hmm. one day a week as sort of a time efficient strategy. Sometimes if athletes aren't going to be as, um, you know, comprehensive in taking their supplements daily, it's an easier strategy to do that. So you've written a whole paper on this topic, obviously. You know, can you walk listeners through some of the potential consequences of taking, you know, one large bolus of vitamin D? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, what, what you just described was actually kind of um, 
the reason that, that got us to think about this and to, to do a study on this is that in our applied experience working with clubs and you know working alongside practitioners from other clubs we we saw that it was quite common that people were um, dishing out the whole week's worth of vitamin D in in one dose um, you know quite commonly as, as you suggest we've seen you know 50 to 100,000 international units given given at once um, which is which is a really really high dose of, of vitamin D. For sure. um, and if we think that the RDA for vitamin D, even though it might be a bit low, it, it's it's eight hundred international units. So if we're given a hundred thousand in a day, just to give you know listeners a bit of uh, uh, some references to super physiological uh, dose there, right? It's massive. It, it's massive, and it's not just really in um, professional sport where we see that. You know, the, there are medical reports out there published where you know you see. Uh, 100,000 international unit injections um, to try and deal with things like rickets or, or osteoporosis. Um, wow. And, you know, the, the, the key thing here, I guess, um, is that, well, what we wanted to do was, was look at this from, a, from a, a professional athlete standpoint. So we were working with, at the time, um, myself, Graham, and, and a guy called Warren Bradley, who's a, who's a, a sports nutrition practitioner, we were looking um, at the time at, at two different dosing strategies in 46 um, elite rugby players. So one strategy was 35,000 inter- international units per week and one was 75,000 international units per week for 12 weeks. And what we wanted to do was actually go, okay, let's look at all of the vit- or at least all of the vitamin D metabolites that we can we can actually measure at the moment. So that included total 25 OHD. Uh, 125 OHD, the, the the bioactive metabolite. We also looked at the product of um, 25 OHD catabolism, which is 24 25 OHD, and we looked at this across across this time course of, of 12 weeks. Now, what we found was, you know, we think was was really interesting. Um, the main finding was that 70,000 international units per week may actually have been more detrimental for its intended purposes than, than actually um, uh, going with a lower dose. And the reason for that is because we saw an increase in 24-25 OHD production. So we saw an increase in the catabolism of vitamin D. Now, not only did we see that breakdown in vitamin D, we also saw that if we, if we quickly took athletes off that supplementation, the 24-25 OHD remained elevated. Whereas the 125 OHD and the 25 OHD started to come down. So in the face of, of um, declining concentrations of the actual active metabolites, we're seeing an increase in the, in the catabolo- catabolic metabolite, which could actually have um, negative consequences for vitamin D signaling in, in all of the tissues that, that vitamin D um, exerts its effects. So we showed two things really, which was that High dose supplementation um, is is really not the best way to go about supplementing athletes with uh, with vitamin D. And the second thing is that if you rapidly take them off that high dose, it could have uh, even worse consequences. So uh, what the data really imply is that lower doses of vitamin D ingested frequently, so on a a daily basis, um, and a gradual withdrawal from supplementation as we get into sort of the sunnier months when we don't need vitamin D is probably the best way that we need to, to go about supplementation. Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really important finding you guys had there. I mean, even last year I was at a um, strength and conditioning conference and one of the speakers was actually advocating for using these sort of big doses without mm-hmm. considering some of the things that you're mentioning here. So yeah, definitely um, pretty important stuff and a really important one for practitioners to make sure they're double checking because I know a lot of athletes will just take that vitamin D bottle and yeah. sort of go for it, you know? That's that's for sure. I, I think, you know, regulating that I mean, from a practical nutrition perspective, having the vitamin D just out on a table is probably not the best thing to do with athletes because, you know, as 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 I guess everyone listening knows, um, you know, if athletes think something's good, they think more of it is better. Oh, so for sure. If vitamin D is left around and they're taking big high doses, it's, it's probably not having the intended effects that you want. Um, and there is always a risk of toxicity if if it's a if it's a chronic intake of really high vitamin D. Yeah, great, great point. And- 